Merci, alors bienvenue à, à tous de nouveau pour la deuxième partie de, de cette matinée. Alors, je vais euh, présenter euh, notre deuxième intervenant. Euh, Vincent van Gerwenen. Van Gerwenen est un chercheur indépendant, traducteur, éditeur. Il est actuellement co-directeur des éditions euh, Punctum Books, membre du bureau de l'Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association et il co-dirige également la revue euh, d'Ottawa, une revue euh, très connue et appréciée par euh, les nus biologistes. Et, et Vincent est aujourd'hui, et je ne crains pas de le dire, le meilleur spécialiste euh, international du vieux nubien, hein, une langue sur laquelle il travaille depuis, depuis des années. Et je signalerai qu'il vient de publier la nouvelle grammaire de référence du vieux nubien, euh, Reference Grammar of Old Nubian, paru cette année chez Peter. C'est cet ouvrage marquera un tournant dans les études vieux nubien. Uh, thank you, Vincent, for accepting our, our invitation, and we're really glad to have the opportunity to uh, listen to you today. So, Vincent will give us a paper today entitled, so he changed his first title, the new title is Periodizing Old Nubian Philological, Archaeological and Linguistic Approaches. Thank you, Vincent, you can go ahead. Uh, thank you, Damien. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Welcome, um, everybody. Um, let me see if I can share this slideshow and what it will do to my screen. Okay, then you are here. I'm going to move you. All right, good. So, Old Nubian. Um, Old Nubian is a uh, Nubian language belonging to the Northern East Sudanic subgroup uh, of the Nilo Saharan phylum, and it's been described by Claude Rie as a uh, literary koine of the Nubian kingdom of Makuria a literary convention used in a multilingual society to write religious and official documents, but also informal texts, such as letters and graffiti. And the earliest translations into Old Nubian have been suggested to date as far back to the uh, 7th and 8th century uh, by Alexandros and me, whereas the latest texts can be securely dated to the second half of the 15th century. And the presence, in fact, of Meoritic signs in the Old Nubian alphabet furthermore suggests that the development of the Old Nubian script and thus Old Nubian literacy should be dated even earlier, namely to the sixth century um, of the common era. So when we speak about Old Nubian, we are in fact referring to a time frame of about 900 years in which the language was presumably continuously written. And although a diachronic approach to Old Nubian is still wanting, and remains a questionable aim considering the high degree of conservativeness of Old Nubian grammar and orthography over this period of nearly a millennium. Um, I've tried to formulate a first tentative periodization in my recently published grammar that Alexandra was so kind to, uh, to hold up to you all. Um, and this periodization may not perfectly map on to consecutive time periods and not apply to the entire territory in which Old Nubian texts were produced, but at least it allows us to cluster them around certain shared features in terms of grammar, orthography, translation practices, and genres in a, love, in a, in a rough chronological order. So um, we have early Old Nubian, um, seventh, eighth century and comprises uh, translations from Greek created during uh, the initial spread of Christianity from Coptic monastic environments. We have Middle Old Nubian, which is the garbage bag in which we put everything that's not in anything else. Um, Archaizing Old Nubian, which is a rather well-defined set of texts from around the turn of the 12th century. Again, translations from Greek, but of hymnical texts, often bilingual. And then late Old Nubian starting at least in the uh, 12th century up to the end of Old Nubian literacy in the 15th, uh, documentary texts mainly, and uh, 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 as we will see with an increased presence of uh, vernacular uh, forms. So in the, in the following uh, presentation, I would like to briefly survey each of these periods and discuss the philological, archeological and linguistic bases on which these uh, uh, periods, uh, periods are proposed. So early Old Nubian comprises texts produced during the first wave of Old Nubian literacy spreading from Coptic monastic environments. And uh, uh, Alexander has already talked uh, at length about uh, uh, the very complicated history of these transmissions. 
Um, this is, however, the most likely origin of Old Nubian literacy, considering the fact that the traditional letter form in which Old Nubian manuscripts are written, the so-called Nubian style magic school, uh, also known as a slanted ansiol, was developed in the White Monastery in, in Sohag in, in Upper Egypt, as, as suggested by uh, An Boudor. The main text representing uh, early Old Nubian is the so-called Sarah East Codex, uh, containing Pseudochrysostomos in Venerambilem Kuchen Sermo, whose manuscript has been provisionally dated, mainly based on archaeological evidence, to the 12th century by uh, Gerald Brown. The argument leading Alexandros and me to a dating of the original translation to the 7th and 8th or 8th century has two interlinked steps. On the one hand, we need to ascertain that we are dealing here with indeed a translation from Greek and not another language or perhaps even an original composition, by arguing that certain particularities of the Old Nubian texts are highly likely to have been generated by a process of translation. And on the other, we need to prove that the 12th century manuscript is a copy of an earlier autograph. And the dating of the extant manuscripts that are most likely closest to the Greek prototype used for the Old Nubian translation from which the Sarah East Codex was copied, then gives us an approximate dating for the Old Nubian uh, prototype. Uh, for reasons of brevity, and I really hope I can be brief and I really hope I won't go over time, um, I will give a few representative examples uh, and uh, further uh, evidence is provided in our chapter in uh, Madalina Tota and uh, Dan Batovici's Caught in Translation, a publication by Alexandros and me. So, um, also side note, um, the Old Nubian font that you see uh, being used here uh, has been released recently in its alpha version uh, by Arbab. Uh, who I think is also in the audience currently, and he has been working very hard on this font, and I'm really, really excited to actually use this um, in, in practice because it is a very, very uh, beautiful approximation of uh, Old Nubian uh, script form. So, um, in this particular example, uh, Brown reconstructs a colon after the first affirmative verb, which you see marked in red. I'm not sure if you can see actually my mouse in any way, but uh, this is the this affirmative verb, and here you see the reconstructed colon, um, based on the fact that it's also appearing uh, after the second uh, instance of this verb. Um, the verb form also clearly indicates that uh, this is the end of the sentence, as this type of affirmative verb form is often used in the apodosis of a conditional clause construction. And uh, the only Greek manuscript that has a colon at this specific point in the text is a 9th century Greek magic school manuscript from Sinai, which is also the oldest extant uh, Greek witness. Um, further evidence is that both the Old Nubian text and the Sinai manuscript omit part, uh, the, the same part of the text, uh, a similar part of the text. So the, the Sinai omits the sentence following the first analogous, so Sinai doesn't contain this. Um, whereas Old Nubian um, omits the part that is in Sinai, but is after the second column, right? So you see a similar type of uh, deletion pattern probably caused by copying practices uh, in both the Sinai and the Old Nubian manuscript. Um, it also should be noted that uh, the Sinai manuscript writes estai for the correct plural form este. So uh, this is because of sound changes in Greek um, and uh, the, 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 the resulting uh, confused spelling sometimes of uh, forms. And we see actually here a similar mistake in, um, in the uh, Old Nubian. So the Greek manuscript here um, has uh, teresetai, uh, writing alpha yota for epsilon, making it a singular verb. And indeed, the uh, Old Nubian uh, uh, translator has here a singular uh, verb, but that is no longer uh, in agreement with the uh, uh, second plural uh, personal pronoun. So we see here that a, a spelling mistake in the Greek, uh, in which a plural form is spelled as a singular form because the endings sound the same, um, leads to a singular form in Old Nubian, which then no longer is grammatically correct, but you know, obviously a correct translation from the mistaken Greek. 
Um, a more dramatic example of, uh, of this kind of vowel uh, confusion um, is how oh, this goes very fast is um, on page three of our uh, Sarah East Codex, in uh, which we have the rather remarkable declaration uh, for the word does not have spirit. Um, you know, this would be a very interesting uh, uh, theological uh, intervention. Um, were it not that it seems to be the case that uh, um, we have a line of manuscripts in which um, the dative moi um, is, uh, 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 is misread for the homophonous, uh, homophonous uh, negation ma. Um, and so we see here that uh, whereas you would expect some type of dative pronoun, it is actually uh, uh, spelled as a uh, negative uh, particle, which then ends up in the Old Nubian, perfectly translated, but, uh, but rather, um, uh, rather interesting in the theological effects that it would have if we would uh, take this at face value. Um, so our next question is, um, so these are a few examples of, of you know, why we think that this, uh, um, uh, this text was translated from Greek, because like errors in the Greek are literally uh, apparent in, in the Old Nubian translation. Um, and so our next question is whether this is an autograph translated and produced in the 12th century, or whether this uh, manuscript that we're dealing with, the series Codex, is a copy. And so if we return again to our text, we see that um, it's probably a copy. So there are a, a couple of uh, mistakes, and again, I'll take out a few. So here we have uh, a sentence that says, as it has been known, every single other manuscript in any other language uh, of this text um, has, uh, as it has been written uh, in, in Greek, gegraptai uh, gar. Um, if we look at the Old Nubian, then actually the difference between as it has been known, as it has been written, is a single letter. So like uh, here we have, as it has been known, uh, yorta kesin. Um, as it has been written would be barta kesin. So it's, it's simply a, a, single, um, uh, a single initial consonant that is different. Um, and moreover, this verb to know occurs in the context of this text quite uh, frequently. So it is understandable why also in this case, the, uh, the scribe may have um, mistakenly written the wrong verb. Um, there are a few more other examples which uh, provide uh, similar types of evidence. Um, and if we assess uh, uh, our text uh, as, our, as a copy, and if that is indeed correct, then uh, the next question is, it is a copy, it is a translation from Greek, um, but how far back uh, should we date this original translation and from which the Sarah East Codex is a copy? Um, so we have found uh, several indications that the Old Nubian translation preserves a number of features that point to a rather early line of witnesses. And so one of the more spectacular examples of this is that the Old Nubian text preserves a citation from Ecclesiasticus 25.9, which has been lost in all Syriac and Greek witnesses, but has been preserved in a Latin uncial manuscript from the BNF dated to the seventh, eighth century, right? which is also actually one of the oldest, if not the oldest attestation of this text. Um, and although an early witness in Latin may complicate the question as to the language from which, uh, in which this particular Psydochrysostomian sermon was written, um, we adhere to the traditional opinion that, uh, from protistic studies, that this homily is part of the so-called Battle of the Saudi Epigrapha, which I really would like to see a, a movie version of, um, taking place, um, if not already during the lifetime of Chrysostomos, uh, then certainly in the years following his death in, in 407. So the community of uh, evidence points to the Sarah East Codex as a product of uh, a scribe copying from the 12th century, an Old Nubian translation from a Greek manuscript dating no later than the 7th or 8th century. So now that we've been able to date, to date this text using philological techniques, um, we can look at the linguistic features of this particular text and determine whether there are other Old Nubian texts which exhibit similar linguistic features. Um, features <coughs> that hopefully are not uh, prone to invention or to copying mistakes and that that are stable within a certain delimited time frame. So um, 
the most prominent feature of uh, the Serious Codex um, that is found in very few other texts is the use of a comparative and superlative suffix enoch. Um, and we find this times uh, we find this suffix several times uh, in comparison. So in, in, in supposedly later texts, this, this suffix has disappeared and we see other morphemes taking up a similar meaning. So here we have an example, uh, how shall I marvel at your zeal, which is more zealous than fire. And here we see um, this uh, suffix present. Um, it also appears in, um, in superlative construction, actually in the opening, in the title of the text. Um, this is the word of praise of the Holy Cross uh, of the holiest John, right? Uh, here in his Um And we see actually this same suffix in a bunch of other texts. So we have it in a uh, translation of Cyril of Jerusalem's sermon in Quater Animalia that um, Alexandros and Damien are currently, we are currently working on this text and it's wider uh, 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 philological context in different languages. So we find it uh, here. Um, we see it in another text by Pedro Chrysostomos uh, in Raphaelem Argelang, uh, Ar Arkhangelum, uh, found in uh, Kasir Brim. And we found it also in a um, lectionary. Oh, here, right here. Uh, here, in the highest, uh, interestingly connected to a uh, noun in this case. So, Besides this comparative suffix, early Old Nubian texts also feature unassimilated pronominal forms, a functional distinction between present and past forms of the second person affirmative suffix, a distinction that also appears in later texts, and also a high occurrence of certain auxiliary constructions, and I'm not going to bother you with all of these, but as a result we can start, you know, circumscribing what are the so-called then early texts um, and this is at least, I think, uh, a big, the beginning of a list uh, of, such, of such texts. And these are all texts, I think we should emphasize, that we expect to be produced in a period when Christianity um, is happening, in, uh, 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 is spreading in Nobadia and Makuria. We have sermons, we have liturgical texts uh, that can be put to immediate use. And uh, for example, the, 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 the uh, Sarah East Codex is, you know, as a text, quite effective in chastising priests, you know, you should do a better job, uh, which is precisely the thing that you want to have, like a pep talk when you are uh, about to convert large parts of a population. So it, it makes sense to have these types of texts and not, you know, more uh, precise, like very detailed theological, uh, 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 conceptually uh, 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 complex uh, texts. So then the second, um, the second period that I would like to discuss uh, is archaizing, archaizing Old Nubian. Um, so I'm skipping over middle Old Nubian for the moment because that's kind of the, the grab bag uh, 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 category uh, that, I'll, that I'll look at at the end. Um, this is a corpus of texts with very precise linguistic features uh, and it's nearly fully comprised of bilingual and semi-bilingual Old Nubian and uh, Greek hymnical texts. So we have fully bilingual text. So every verse is present in both Greek and then Old Nubian. We have uh, semi-bilingual uh, texts in which we have an alternation between Greek and Old Nubian uh, verses. This of course raises all kinds of interesting questions about how these things are used in liturgical contexts uh, that I'm not going to go into today. Um, I'm sure Alexandros has a lot of interesting things to say about that. And then we have a, uh, a one monolingual uh, a text that is only in Old Nubian. Um, now, because a number of these texts appear on walls, we can establish an approximate dating based on archaeological evidence. So here we shift registers, so to say, and we're, gonna, we're going to use archaeology in order to situate these texts in time. So if we are then able to establish stylistic and linguistic features in common between the wall texts and the texts on other carriers, you know, as you can see, some of them are on parchment, uh, some of them are on walls. We have one that is actually written on wood, uh, discussed by uh, Giovanni Ruffini. Um, if we then are able to link these texts together on different media, um, then we can assign them to a similar period. And so, um, this particular text on the wall, which is um, part of the funerary complex 
that includes the, the crypt uh, with all the text on it that, that Alexandra showed in his uh, presentation. Um, this text has been dated um, to uh, 1063, to between 1063 and 1113 uh, of the Common Era, uh, based on uh, the uh, period in which the bishop uh, that it refers to was alive. Um, but considering this is a funerary uh, a crypt environment, we, you know, probably this was built later on in his life when it may have been clear that he was going to die and, uh, you know, you need to start constructing your, uh, your grave. Um, oh, this, yep. So um, the other wall texts found around the same side um, that recently were published by uh, Adam Whiter and me should be probably uh, dated to the same period. Um, at the same time, uh, we have an archaeological context of one of the uh, texts uh, found on parchment um, that should be dated to before the 13th century. So this gives us really a rough estimation of, okay, when, when do we situate these texts? Um, there is a rather uh, early assignment of 10th century by Barnes to uh, the, Benedi the, the, the Benedicite. Uh, text, uh, which I think is, is is simply incorrect, because he bases himself on paleography, which we know hardly anything about, let alone we would know anything about in 1974. So uh, we should simply ignore this conjecture. Um, so Adam and I recently proposed that all these hymnical texts should be assigned to a particular translation school emerging from uh, um, uh, Makuria uh, around the turn of the 12th century perhaps connected to a broader historical and cultural developments, which are uh, such as um, the uh, union of the ruling families of Makuri and Alwa, uh, the introduction of the toponym Dotawa, which is also around the same period that we find the first attestations of this word. I am really not so sure whether Dotawa as a self-designation existed since the beginning of Makuria. Um, it is also the period in which we see the introduction of a new type of horned crown, uh, and also novel developments in pottery styles, right? So we see a whole bunch of developments, uh, uh, cultural developments that may fit well into a pattern uh, that also includes a new way to deal with translation practices and a new way to translate Greek texts. And uh, this is not at all very strange to consider. I have used uh, the, term, the term archaizing here because the language used in these hymnical texts feels rather self-consciously archaic and artificial. So all texts include, for example, uh, unassimilated phenomenal forms for the genitive and syntactical constructions designed to closely imitate the Greek prototype. Uh, and in his study of Coptic translations, of the Septuagint, uh, Askeland makes a distinction between what he calls obligatory, obligatory explicitation, which is, quote, caused by the lack of equivalent syntactic categories, and opt optional explicitation, which, quote, resolves stylistic differences between the source and the translation languages, without which a translation would be clumsy. Now, clumsy is, of course, a maybe a little bit of a difficult word to use in, an, in, a, in a more uh, theoretical context. But um, these both types, uh, both these types of explicitation, um, they serve in the end to render the Greek forlage as closely as possible to, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 to, to mold this forlage into, into your target language. And so, this really fits quite well, this idea of, 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 of nearly a literal type of translation is really quite well with the Nord Nubian material because we, can, we will see um, that the translations are really as literal as possible in terms of syntactic structure. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you get word orders that you would otherwise never find in other Old Nubian texts. Uh, uh, and this, this suggests that they really try to push the boundaries of what was syntactically acceptable. We see something similar, for example, in, in, in Wulfila's a, a Gothic translation of the Greek Bible, which, you know, is basically Greek word order in a Germanic language, which, which no doubt for actual native speakers of Gothic in that period must have sounded incredibly strange. Um, so I am going to discuss a few features then of these uh, of these texts. So um, the first one is uh, extended personal pronouns. 
um, possessor and adjective inversion and, and forms of leftward uh, movement. Um, so let's see, let me go to the next slide. So uh, the way that these, I hope this is kind of clear, the way that these examples are structured is that first I have the standardized uh, uh, Greek, then I have in two lines, the Greek from uh, the text uh, from the wall or from the parchment and underneath aligned with it, the old Nubian, right? So these are two consecutive, two consecutive verses in one in Greek, one in old Nubian superimposed so you can see how they are matching. And then under C, you find the actual analysis of the old Nubian text. Um, so what we see here um, is uh, the use of extended personal pronouns, such as here, uh, Irin. Um, usually we would expect in, uh, nearly in all other texts from other periods we find in, um, but this is, this either is an innovative form or this is a form imported from spoken language that um, we simply don't see anywhere else. Um, and this is a specific feature of this text is the presence of these types of genitive personal pronouns. So it's a really good, it's a really good marker, let's say, for, uh, for these types of texts. Um, then we have um, possessor and adjective inversion. So in, in, in Old Nubian, usually uh, um, a genitive precedes, um, precedes the noun. I'm not sure how my hands work in mirror in, in a Zoom, but like one precedes the other. <laughs> um, and what you see in these texts is that because in, uh, uh, um, uh, in Greek, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, this order is sometimes reversed. Also, Old Nubian tries to uh, imitate this reverse order. So here in this case, uh, we have uh, in triboi uh, autea, uh, so uh, the, the path of justice. Um, and we see here uh, that uh, 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 Old Nubian, uh, where we would normally expect something like tichkanen uh, til, tilpula or something, tilpila, um, we now find tilpu tichkanenila. Um, uh, which leads to what, what you can call, which you can see here, uh, this is not properly aligned, so this should be here and this should be there. Um, what, you, what you can define basically as, as case stacking. This is the technical term where you see a data followed by a genitive. This is not normally what's happening, but this type of stacking is the result of, of orders being switched around. Uh, and again, this is quite rare otherwise in Old Nubian text, but it's frequent in these types of uh, texts because they really would like to mimic the constituent order of the, the Greek. Um, and then finally, we see all kinds of interesting leftward movement uh, happening in these translations because uh, a Greek at that moment in time uh, has become an SVO language, which means that the subject precedes the verb, but the object uh, follows the verb. And so this is a, a development uh, uh, that we see happening uh, uh, in Greek, actually before the medieval period already. Um, the unfortunate uh, situation is that uh, Old Nubian is an SOV language. So the verb usually comes at the very end. And so uh, uh, our uh, translators um, invent all kinds of ways in which we can get that verb up the sentence so that it's in the place where the Greek verb is. Um, now, one of the ways in which this is done, and you see this here, is, uh, uh, is with imperative forms, and imperative forms can already move up. So imperative, imperative sentences, in a way, are easy, um, because this verb can already go to the beginning or like early in the sentence without being completely ungrammatical. Uh, and so we see it twice here, we see a, a Greek uh, imperative form, and then really, you know, uh, the Old Nubian form exactly in the same position in the, in, in the sentence. Um, we, for example, also see this, this, this wonderful uh, intervention here of a vocative right in the middle of the sentence. Old Nubian would never do this. The vocative would come at the beginning and not really in the middle. Like why, you know, why is it in the middle? Because in Greek it's in the middle. Uh, um, yeah. So I'm going to skip maybe part of the little technical analysis because that's a bit too much. Um, and then uh, let's see, let's take these away. Yeah. And then another way to move uh, the verb leftward is by using so-called affirmative forms. 
Now, again, these are, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, common in the apodosis of a uh, uh, conditional class construction. So like in the second part of a conditional class, like the then class, let's say. Um, but in these texts, we see these verb forms used in all kinds of situations where you wouldn't expect them. Um, but the nice thing about these forms is, is that these can also be early on in the sentence. So like affirmative verb forms in, in Nubian have a quality that you would usually call verb second. Um, for example, Dutch has verb second uh, as well. So like the main verb goes to second position in the sentence. And uh, Old Nubian affirmative verb forms can occupy that same syntactical position without any problem. And so it allows us again to get that verb up in the sentence and mimic Greek. And uh, an example we see here where we have uh, uh, um, this firm pesadime, um, this m uh, is our uh, affirmative suffix and it allows the verb to, to be in this, in this higher position. Um, now, <laughs> apparently the desire to imitate Greek word order becomes so big that at some point or certain translators decide, I don't need an imperative, I don't need an affirmative, I'm just going to use a regular verb form to do exactly the same thing. And this leads to what is no doubt something that sounds very strange to, you know, anyone who would have spoken uh, uh, um, a vernacular form of the language. Uh, with with a, a a verb form, a regular verb form without any type of marking right in the beginning of the sentence. Um, but you know this this apparently happens. So we see really the extent to which the, the desire to adhere to a certain type of conservative form, uh, a truthful form, most probably, uh, 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 warps warps the grammar of the language. And so this allows us again then to um, to really define this set. It's actually probably the best defined set of texts that we have in terms of its linguistic features. Then late Old Nubian. Um, so whereas with you know, early Old Nubian, we have to rely on philological evidence and with archaizing uh, Old Nubian, we have to rely on uh, uh, archaeological evidence. With late Old Nubian, we can also just use dates uh, that are in texts, which is really great. So, you know, the text actually gives us a date when it's written. And why is that? Because these are, you know, contracts, these are, these are, these are legal documents, these are letters. Um, they go from, you know, different people to each other. So sometimes we also know when these people lived. So there is again, a different type of evidence that we can use to place these texts in time. Um, and this is a small list of, of, of texts of which we have a date. And as you can see, this ranges from like 12th till 15th century, but I don't think that there any, there's any reason to, to think that uh, old Nubian linguistic features didn't already um, uh, sorry, late Old Nubian linguistic features didn't already appear earlier, let's say, in, in maybe uh, 10th or 11th century. And I will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so we have this small corpus of texts. We have a lot of texts, especially from Kasserim, that were found in the neighborhood so that we can think, well, it's probably more or less at least in the same centuries. Um, and so, again, this allows us to build up a, a, a set of linguistic features that we can then test on other texts of which the dating is less clear because they're found in other sites, uh, because uh, they are eaten by wolves and so on, right? So um, we have uh, written assimilation, we have a dative in alpha, we have deletion of a final consonant, we have developments in the verb, um, and including an innovative perfect uh, tense, and a whole bunch of crazy verbal forms that I would really like to study much more, but which I haven't, but I'm going to give a few examples of what's, what's going on. And we know from currently spoken Nubian languages that the verb has really changed. Uh, it's, and so we expect the moment that we are later in the period to see these changes happening. And they are happening and they are being represented in these, in these documentary texts. So that's in itself is very exciting in terms of the analysis of language change, but we haven't done that work yet completely. Um, so let's let's have a look at at then what this looks like. Um, assimilation. So assimilation is a process in which two adjacent uh, sounds uh, adopt each other's features, right? Uh, so you see this here with the accusative. The accusative is normally ka, uh, but here it has turned into a uh, a t after another t. So makita. Um, now this is very interesting because. 
uh, as I said before, all Nubian orthography is really quite conservative. Um, but we can imagine that these types of assimilations already happened in spoken in the spoken languages uh, as Old Nubian was being written. And so the only so what we're seeing here is not an innovation or something new that's happening in Old Nubian. What we simply see here is a, ref a reflex of spoken language entering into the written language, um, which probably happens, you know, decades, if not centuries after the actual thing already uh, you know, occurred on the ground, so to say. Um, the same holds for these uh, 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 datives in A. So here we have an example, when in heaven and on earth, twice a dative, which is usually la after a noun, uh, but here we have harmla and iskita. Um, so in, 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 let's say, classical text or whatever that means, we would see, we'd see something like harmila uh, on, on iskitila. Uh, and so we see this type of contraction uh, happening in these texts. Then uh, a really nice di diachronic uh, <laughs> somehow uh, a progression of, of a formula where you not only see like uh, uh, language change in action but also the way in which really formulaic phrases uh, 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 get, get petrified in time until the morphology becomes completely uh, 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 Intransparent, right? In the same way that we end up with abacadabra uh, from Hocast Corpus, right? So this is really quite a similar uh, example. So we have a, a, a curse formula, uh, which we see here um, from a text from Kasir Ibrahim. So whoever will deny this denies God, um, where we have the, the, the appearance twice of this uh, verb to deny. Um, oh, this is uh, here it says Holy Trinity at the bottom. Um, a second later, whatever later here means, but, but a, a second uh, a more uh, evolved example, let's say, um, is uh, also from Kasir Ibrim, where we see the drop here of uh, the final nu. So that's no longer here. And we know from modern uh, Nubian languages that this final nu in verbal forms uh, uh, and probably also in other forms dropped. In fact, this entire topic marker no longer exists in Nobin. So the fact that we would see it deteriorating phonologically already, you know, a couple of centuries before is expected. And that's exactly what's happening here, right? So we no longer find the new. Until we arrive at a uh, text from Jebel Ada that I'm currently editing, uh, it's a sale, beautifully preserved, complete, uh, but it's very late, late 15th century. Um, and uh, here we see not only is this new drop, but the two verb forms are completely, so this is actually like a more a verbal noun form and the main verb have basically completely imitated each other, right? So they have adopted features from each other. Uh, their, their, uh, their analysis, except for the root is completely opaque, but you can see here this, that this must mean that this thing was used over and over again, over centuries uh, uh, until, you know, they are basically worn off as forms um, and they become completely formulaic. Um, and so this is, I think this is a really nice example how you can see that over centuries, you know, from basically 12th to 15th century, um, this thing completely petrifies. Then um, finally, I think we have this innovative perfect. Um, so you see that in uh, modern Obin, you have an innovative perfect in Ko, and you see again in these uh, documentary texts, really a nice development first of the thing as some type of auxiliary um, in, or like in a convert construction. And then finally, we see it appearing as a full suffix, precisely in the position where it is today in Nobin. Um, this is in no way a correct proper old Nubian form, but it is it is totally a correct Nobin form. Uh, and it's very nice to see this, you know, occurring in, in this letter, I think it is. So then finally, and to conclude, um, let's have a look at middle old Nubian, uh, which is actually the most difficult category. Um, so these are texts that cannot be assigned to any of the other periods. Um, and they are these large, classical Old Nubian texts, the ones that were first found 
uh, the ones that were first described and the, the text on which we have based our entire grammar, basically, since, you know, since the first grammatical descriptions, defy the, despite the fact that these are at least the vaguest in terms of like, where and when are these texts. Um, so we have a bunch of major texts uh, that is really like the classical canon of Old Nubian text and a few minor ones that, that exhibit similar linguistic uh, features. And so part uh, of the impossibility for any form of positive categorization of these texts is that they were all put on the market uh, in the early 20th century without any provenance, without any reconstructable archaeological context. Um, and moreover, except for the lectionary, they, are, they don't appear to be any obvious translations. So we also cannot use the methodology that we use with Pratoxostomos with the Ceres Codex to see, you know, where does it fit into a manuscript tradition? We just, they're, they're in a way like orphans. Um, they look like other texts that we know in Greek or Syriac or, or whatever, or Coptic, but they're not those texts. And so it, it may very well be that these are really original compositions. Um, so recent work of Alexandros and me has confirmed that the Staros text and the Libris, uh, the Libris Institutionis Michaelis belong to this genre of uh, uh, Coptic literary genre of apostolic memoirs. But again, they belong to that genre, but they are not really one-on-one -on -one translations from any text that we know. Um, moreover, it appears that these texts show evidence of an oral tradition. And this is again, a hunch that, that Damien, Alexander and I are currently also following uh, when it comes to this uh, in Quattro Animalia text. Um, an oral tradition uh, from which individuals quite borrowed to produce their manuscripts. And so ironically, because the major texts were first published and studied witnesses of the Old Nubian languages, language and form its most extensive record, uh, they also, as I said, form the foundation of our grammatical description from which all the other periods are deviating. Um, right, because like I define, I define basically these other periods as, you know, these show grammatical aspects that are deviant from the middle of Nubian. The problem is, is that Middle Nubian is the least defined of them all. And so there is a little bit of a paradox here um, that I'm not entirely sure how to solve. Um, the absence of strong evidence that these texts are direct translations from prototypes in another language may point us, however, to a important shared positive feature of Middle Old Nubian texts. They are all the products of a mature scribal culture firmly embedded within the oral traditions of the broader Northeast African Christian world, but with its own ideas, preferences and style and capable of producing original works of literature that served the needs of the local population. And um, with that a positive note, um, I uh, conclude my lecture and I thank you for your attention and I welcome any uh, questions. Thank you, Vincent, for your uh, for your talk. That that, that is really impressive. Uh, you, since uh, I, I just marvel, uh, you know, since Gerald Brown's treatment of uh, the grammar of Newman, uh, just marvel the, the contribution, the enormous contribution, you know, to to all Newman uh, grammar in terms of synchronic and as you showed, as in in diachronic. Uh, diachronic analysis of all women. This is very, very interesting. Uh, just uh, 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 let myself uh, ask you a first question, if I may. Um, would you have any what, evidence um, of uh, translation into El Nubian from Coptic or even Arabic? I, I remember that uh, Gerald Brand wrote an article uh, about the structure. I, I don't re remember well, um, but he, he wrote an article about a structure in the room that copied, that imitated uh, an Arabic particle in Nema. Yeah. And, yes. And I don't know if no. you have any, <laughs> <laughs> any idea, but just you, so translations are made on Greek. So based yeah. on Greek. So. This is uh, this is something that Alexandros and I have long, long broken our brains about. Is there any evidence for translation from Coptic? If there is, we have not found it. Um, there, is, there is no text that exhibits like the types of translation features that we see in the Sarah East Codex, for example, where you know, there, you know, we see copying editors, we, 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 see, we see 
strange features of the text that can be attributed to issues that found are found in Greek. And ideally, you would like to find similar issues, for example, but then in relation to a Coptic text. And uh, uh, the Star Wars text, uh, which has been thought to perhaps be a translation from Coptic, does not exhibit any of such features. In fact, it is really good old Nubian. Uh, and and Alexandros and I have basically concluded that this that this is probably an original composition based, of course, on a shared, let's say, archive, oral archive of, of texts, um, or perhaps even inspired by texts that were lying around in the scriptorium, but, but certainly uh, uh, not something that is a one-on-one -on -one translation uh, uh, from, from another language. Yeah. So, and as, as regards Arabic, I think that is completely speculative and... Uh, uh, I don't think Brown has given any real evidence for that. Um, whether it is at all impossible that such texts existed, I don't know. Uh, um, especially in the later period, uh, we see also an appearance of a large amount of Arabic, no, not large amount, relatively large amount of Arabic loan words in Old Nubian documentary evidence. Uh, and and Gregor has, has studied extensively the appearance of Arabic names uh, uh, in, in Old Nubian texts. So. Yeah, there was linguistic influence, whether that is, you know, on the level of translation or on the level of, you know, the people appearing in a text and, and, and vocabulary, that's, of course, a different question. Okay. There is a text of Joel, there is a question of Joel, unless, yes, yeah, shall I just answer it? So the, the question is, um, do the translations of archaizing uh, Nubian text Share prosodic elements with the Greek forlage. Um, this is uh, this is a hotly debated uh, item between Alexandros and me. Um, not in the sense that I necessarily disagree with him, uh, because I do think that a lot of these texts had them being oral texts must have had metrical aspects um, uh, that were important for memorization and for chanting. Um, the nature. Uh, of these uh, metrical aspects, whether these be alexandrines or anything else, is of course to be debated in the sense that we would need to have a firm grasp of Old Nubian syllabic structure, uh, vowel length, and all kinds of aspects of those texts, phonological aspects that we do not understand properly yet, right? And even knowing what a syllable is or what can be considered a syllable does not tell you necessarily something about uh, metricization, right? And for Japanese, uh, Japanese moraic metric structure is, I think, a case in point where what is a syllable is very different from what is a metric unit. And so we cannot make a lot of assumptions. However, it seems that some texts really do have a similar syllable count in certain hymnical parts. And this definitely points to some form of metric uh, a, a metric structure uh, that is that is let's say extra textual. Um, whether those are the same as in Greek, this is a, of course a, like a second level question. Yeah, I think the first thing would be to establish whether, and I think we are not we have not done even enough anthropological research in this, whether we can establish Nubian metrical structures. Right. I mean, I would love to know much more about you know Nubian song, to you know to see whether these structures have survived. I mean, why not? Um, but I don't know anything about a Nubian song. Yeah. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, other questions? May, yes, may I? Yes. yes. Um, as always, fascinating. And uh, despite mentioning my name that much it's uh, it's 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 i'm always learning so much by hearing you uh, restructuring our thoughts uh, putting forward your uh, ideas uh, out of all these years working with these texts um, i had some thoughts about syllabization uh, uh, when it comes to leftward uh, uh, leftward movement uh, because um, it seems that they could do so many different things, but sometimes they decide not to do it. Sometimes they do. Of course, we don't know the prosody in, 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 in the Greek Psalms. We don't know how this would have been performed in Nubia. 
So I don't know if I, I would really uh, insist on uh, you trying to tell me why would they, um, ha um, change the, 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 some morphemes in order to move leftward one thing and not the other. Mm -hmm. We could perhaps investigate that in the uh, course of uh, our work, but I think it was slide 15 that was attracted my attention with the, with an A-reel uh, something uh, which was not uh, inversed. It's, it's the example where you had the Engyoda, uh, the uh, vocative yeah. in the middle. So the one part is being uh, inversed. Right. Okay. You have the vocative. Example 15? Was it? I, I mean, don't know. I um, okay, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter much because no. we're going to detail and we don't have time for that. But briefly, um, my initial hypothesis would be that um, whenever something can be grammatically arranged in such a way that it mimics Greek word order, they will try to do it. They don't always do it, but they'll definitely try. The, the cases in which you really wonder why they didn't do it, and I kind of skipped over that example because it's a little bit technical, is because there are really heavy syntactical constraints that prevent you from doing it and doing it will make this, the sentence sound completely ungrammatical and not just a little bit crooked. Um, I do not think that metrical considerations were solely at the basis of those decisions. I can imagine, for example, sometimes you don't find uh, a long genitive pronoun. Why is that? Why suddenly there is in instead of eating? Oh, maybe because you want one syllable instead of two? I don't know, right? So, so yes, there is definitely place for nuance there. But I think primarily the constraints are syntactical in nature. Thank you. Uh, uh, Damian, if there is nobody else who's uh, uh, raising their hand to ask something, then the other question that I would have for Vincent is the following. You place the flory legume in the early period. I find this very interesting not why how do you do that you didn't give us an example of that no, is it because not. of the of the of the biblical text that are cited because this is a very puzzling um, text i don't know exactly why think. it probably had mm. some one or two of the features that that belong to that period and i would have to look into my notes but it may be the use of the affirmative or something it, okay. it probably does not contain the superlative Enoch because I would have put it in the example list because that's the one I talked about. It must have been one of the others. Yeah, I mean- It's a text it, worthwhile turning our attention It is to absolutely some. a text worthwhile looking at, yes. I mean, it has some really interesting linguistic features that I really don't think are, are late. Thank you again and big, 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 big <laughs> on congrats for that. Thank you. Questions? Remarks. <clears throat> I must have been exceedingly clear. <laughs> Got one question again. Um, no, just, just maybe, maybe just yes. a comment, but yes. from uh, far, far away because uh, I'm not at all familiar with this topic. But uh, just to say how impressive I. I I find your your work, your effort to put uh, stated, uh, stages in the language development in its context. I mean, to to your your, your effort to put it in um, yeah in several stages of development of, of of the language. It's it's very very impressive, and uh, I I feel it quite uh, rare in your um, in your field. Uh, this um, this willing to put it in uh, in context. So yeah, it, it, it's very very impressive and uh, fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you. I I mean I, I obviously this is not only my idea, right? So so I, I think it's really the result of the way in which we have started to approach Nubian studies over the last three years with a group group of people, some of whom are actually present currently uh, uh, here with us. Um, to really, the, the, the evidence from, from, from Akuria and from Nobedia is so fragmentary. I mean, you've seen the, the materials that Alexander presented. You, we, have to, we have to combine forces and we have to put all the evidence together. Any, any type of evidence that we can find, linguistic, archaeological, pottery, uh, historical, anthropological, all of that needs to be taken into consideration to come to even some form of semi-plausible story about what these things mean. 
and and I certainly have 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 profited enormously, uh, you know, being a linguist, from being very frequently in a room with you know with my colleagues who come from very different ways of thinking about periodization, about what evidence means, how to put things together, and I really think that. This type, I mean, what I've presented today is really the result of that type of multidisciplinary environment. And it's it's been an incredibly fertile, uh, incredibly fertile way to think, uh, to think about it, right? Because when you do look at Archaeas and Old Nubian, you're like, okay, there are all these texts, you know, they share linguistic features and based on that, we can say something about them. But then when you see, okay, they're on the walls of these types of buildings, but wait, in that period, you know, there was a merger of Awa and and, and Makuria under the same royal family, supposedly, you know, so uh, then you can start to think, okay, why, you know, why did they do this? Why suddenly do we see the appearance? Well, maybe we have to assert royal power in a different way. Maybe we want to make a mark on a literary tradition because we're starting anew and we're putting two horns on our crowns, right? So at the moment that you, that you see your colleagues piecing together such a, a transformation in society, based on other types of evidence, also what you are looking at suddenly starts to make sense, you know, not, not from a linguistic point of view, but like in this timeline, in, in the development of this language and how did this literacy develop? Uh, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Professor Bauzi, is it me? Thank you very much. I would like to pose a question which actually concerns not explicitly or not exclusively uh, the Nubian tradition. And this is that of the hyperliteral translations. Mm -hmm. So in the end, as we know, uh, this happens in many domains. And my question would be in this specific case, so what happened then? So how could uh, they be used uh, or what we can uh, understand about their, let's say, uh, uh, subsequent existence uh, to the extent if uh, they were so uh, mirror type that uh, the language actually could hardly be understood. This is a general problem. We know this also happened with Ethiopic. And I would like just to know what's your ideas concerning this uh, uh, domain. Many thanks is, again. Yeah, yeah this is a, thank you for your question. This is a very difficult question, right? So. I don't think that the Old Nubian translations were so literal that they were not understandable. I think they sometimes skirt the edge of ungrammaticality, but they stay firmly on the side of what would be possibly acceptable and definitely on the side of what is understandable. Um, to compound this problem is the fact that we are dealing very frequently with this alternating verse pattern, which suggests that whoever was supposed to deal with these texts was at least understanding Greek and Old Nubian in the 11th century in such a way that it would make sense to switch between these two languages within a single psalm. Add to that, that these psalms were written on walls, but not on eye level, but really quite high up. So they were not even, they, were, they, they must not have been there for regular consumption or to, I mean, they were written so small. I mean, these letters are like, you know, half a centimeter sometimes. And you really spent like hours with a magnifying glass on these walls. They were not in, in a dark environment, candlelit environment of a church. These were not meant to be read, you know, and then sung. There is just no way you would comfortably do that. So there is, I think, an enormous question about what these texts were doing there, who they were for, and why they were, you know, why they were written that way. Obviously, a clue could be uh, uh, the, the work that Alexandros already referred to, namely this the, the 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 usage of the text in this in this complex in particular, where you know some of the some of the psalms are on the wall, is this funerary complex uh, that includes this script, and we might want to think that, similarly to the text inside the crypt, these psalms high up on the walls were really not for human readers. Um, which then obviously also uh, uh, fixes the issue of, of, of understandability for a Nubian a vernacular speaker, because angels obviously don't care where you put the verb, right, or demons. So, so then, then the point is not so much that the text should be understandable to uh, um, our, our neighbor uh, from, uh, from the village, 
but uh, uh, that the order of the words in, 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 in mimicking Greek word order is more efficacious in what it's supposed to do, namely to ward off uh, uh, evil. And I am completely inventing this idea on the spot. So I really haven't thought about it, but like simply, it was it is just really because of your question and, and trying to think about this. Uh, uh, um, but but maybe we can explain the fact that certain ungr seeming ungr um, grammaticalities are tolerated simply by the fact that we don't care. This is not for humans. The 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 the, the purpose of the text is not to convey meaning to a human. The purpose of the text, the old Nubian. Uh, is to be efficacious in another realm. Uh, and that's why we're also using Greek, which maybe is indeed not understood by my neighbor who are singing psalms on a Sunday, but is definitely understood by that demon brood uh, haunting uh, our, our environs. So maybe this is the way to think about it. But, <laughs> you know, I see Alexandros like laughing, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but it's it's a, it's 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 been puzzling. I mean, I I, I did the, the 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 work on these plums together with Adam in in Old Dongola, and and to read this text was nearly impossible. If I show you photographs, it's impossible to read. Like this is absolutely unreadable. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> So um, thank you, there's not a question. So thank you, thank you, Benson, for your brilliant talk. That was, that was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you to both Alexandros and Vincent um, for uh, your involvement in the seminar. And thank you for uh, every one of you for, your, um, for being here, you know, though um, remotely, but thank you for your know, participation. That was very, very fruitful. And thank you, thank you. Um, so the, our next session will be um, uh, in May 19th, 19th May, May 19th, and uh, I, I will uh, send you a mail with all the information and the name of our speakers. Um, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. And let's see you uh, next time. Uh, Martina? Just a word, the, uh, the uh, next uh, um, persons that we are invited to this seminar are Massimo Villa and uh, Perrine Pilet uh, that is here with us today, and uh, Alice Croc, uh, that is a serious sister, but, uh, and we are still uh, trying to see if uh, there will be another intervention or not. So if you are curious to see what we are doing, please come and uh, it will be a, a pleasure to see you all. <laughs>